Okay, um, we got a lot of ground to cover tonight. Um, and so uh, I'm going to dive right back in by welcoming everybody back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. This is uh, part seven, part seven of our study of the Sri Maladevi Sutra. Um, we're really just going to pick right back up where we left off last time. Um, tonight's theme, as you can already see, is this idea of ignorance, otherwise known as avidya, the Chinese call wu ming. We're going to get into the language. We're going to get into these words. Our heroine, Srimala Devi, the queen Srimala, at the end of last week, had just introduced this idea of avidya or what she calls underlying ignorance. And that's where we're gonna start. Um, actually, really quickly, before we start, apologies for that. I have all these different notes everywhere. Um, I have just two quick announcements that I wanted to make at the beginning rather than the end, because I know sometimes we get a little, a little like inebriated off the Dharma at the end. And we really, it's like, well, uh, two quick announcements. One, this Friday, at the end of this week, this Friday, I'm doing my visual presentation for San Francisco Dharma Collective. That's at 7.30, not the normal time of Dharma Doors at 7, but 7.30, and that's Friday. And that's going to be on the kind of the most expanded version of Buddhist cosmology, this uh, class I'm calling Oceans of Worlds. Um, and so it's just sort of the, the, the third installment of my series on cosmology. So I wanted to let everybody know about that. And a late, a new development really quickly too, is that I personally, me, Michael, offer a 10 week introduction to Buddhist basics class that I call Turning the Dharma Wheel. Some of you, many of you actually have already taken this course, but I'm going to offer it again next month or starting next month, October 16th to December 18th a 10 week series on Buddhist basics. And you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com and find out more about it there. But this is just a heads up that that's coming on down the road. And so again, I know many of you have already taken it, but if maybe you know somebody that would be interested in it or something like that, uh, please pass on the good word. Okay. I just wanna say, I can highly, highly, highly recommend this course. You know, like there's oh. so much wisdom and um, I will be in Europe, so I, I can't take, I won't be able to pick. But anyway, amazing class. Thanks, Connie. I, I concur. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> all so much. <laughs> it's great. Oh, because awesome. Michael, you're always so humble. So we have to do some marketing <laughs> <for> you here <laughs> on camera. <laughs> I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you all. Okay, excellent. So that's done with the business. Um, let's get back to the sutra. Let's start talking about ignorance. Um, before we do that, though, and actually, I'm going to rewind just a little bit, like just a paragraph, uh, actually, just two little tiny paragraphs that we read last week. I just want to remind you where we're at, though. Queen Sri Mala is basically explaining the Mahayana, this Mahayana Buddhist tradition, as opposed to this kind of earlier, very monastic, very austere, very stoic kind of form of renunciatory Buddhism, where it's about being a monk or a nun, it's about celibacy, about poverty, homelessness. Queen Srimala is here to tell us about this new way of being Buddhist and in, about the virtues of this new way of being Buddhist. And so she, this is what happened last week, is she was just beginning to explain the shortcomings of what is called the Arhat path or the path of the Pratyeka Buddha, the solitary enlightened one. So we're continuing that discourse from last week which is the shortcomings of those two paths, those two vehicles. And what she had said is, 
And now I'm just going to read from the sutra directly what Queen Srimala to told, told us. Actually, she told the world honored one, the Buddha, world honored one. To say that the arhats and pratyeka buddhas know they are no longer subject to future existences does not mean that they have eradicated all defilements or that they know all of their rebirths have been finished. How's that? The arhats and pratyeka buddhas still have some residual defilements not yet eradicated. Therefore, they cannot know that all of their rebirths have been exhausted. Srimala tells us there are two kinds of defilements, underlying defilements and active defilements. Before we get into these specific four underlying defilements, I just want to refresh our memory about what, what is this word defilement, right? Let's get clear about defilement so that this evening is much more fruitful in that way. So this word that the sutra, most English translators translate this as defilement. But the Sanskrit word, the word that you might be used to, is a klesha. And a, a klesha are, is a defilement in that sense. I want to talk about what that word really kind of specifically means. But the idea is that tr you would probably know this idea of the three poisons, the three root causes. This is the idea of the, you know, this idea of a klesha is broad, but in Buddhism specifically, they speak about attraction, aversion, and confusion, right? These ideas of raga, dvesha, and moha, right? So those are the, our traditional kleshas. Those are these traditional defilements. And the image that I want to give you for thinking about defilements and I, th I think this will be helpful for what I have planned for us this evening. Defilements are, a, a good example would be as if, as if you were looking through maybe some binoculars or just looking through a lens. The idea is, is that imagine there was a scuff, a smear, one of those like greasy fingerprint stains, right? On the lens. When you look through it, everything would sort of be distorted a little bit by that greasy stain or by that scratch or by that defilement, by that problem of the lens. In fact, what might happen is you might mistake that scratch or that smear as actually being um, so uh, an object out there or, a, or an aspect of the objects you're looking at rather than the means by which you're looking. So when they talk about defilements, you know, I want to avoid any, anything that might come to mind of senses of like Christian sin or like this idea of the defilement or the idea is, is that we're using our mind to observe the world, but the Buddha has been saying that there's defilements on our mind. And that defilement is sort of distorting what we're looking at. And we are sometimes often mistaking that defilement as not being a problem of the mind, but somehow being a problem of what's out there being perceived by that mind. And so the, the goal or the project of Buddhism is about polishing that lens. The idea of the defilements is often also sometimes likened to a mirror and trying to see your own face in the mirror. But if there's like a greasy smear on the mirror, you might think it's your face and not the apparatus that you're using to see. Mighty, right. maybe you will get to, um, to it later, but what would be the uh, connection or the relationship between defilements and samskaras? Well, 
Well, <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna make a note and I'm, I'm working, I'm gonna work Samskara into this. So rather than answering you right now, Connie, I'm just gonna roll this into the Dharma talk because it, it it's, it's a great question, but let's do it that way because it's gonna come up in a second. So this is just what we're talking about is defilements. Again, this is basic Buddhism. This is the basic idea of Buddhism, that there's defilements of the mind and the practice, whether it's the meditation practice, whether it's the compassion practice, whether it's the giving practice, you know, all these different practices are designed and meant to clear up those defilements. Okay, so now we're not talking about lenses and mirrors. We're talking about minds. We're not talking about greasy smudges. We're at talking about traditionally in Buddhism, we're talking about these three kleshas. Again, they're this idea of attraction, this kind of like, ooh, what's, what's that? And, and a sort of drawing towards, it's, it's a sort of a, a desire in that way. But this isn't desire, it's attraction. This will lead to the active defilement, to use Queen Srimala's language, it will lead to these active defilements like clinging, suffering, of course, um, and all of these ideas, which will be the active defilements. But there's this idea of these underlying defilements. And so that's just to clarify this idea of what is Srimala talking about? She's talking about these kind of well, I dare not call them psychological because that would actually start to move us in a certain way of thinking about this, that I don't really want to think about it quite so psychologically in that way. So let's pull back. We have this sense now of these defilements or kleshas. Now let's think about, and before we dive back into the text, let's understand what Srimala says when she told us, and then she told us this last week too, by the way, that there's four underlying kleshas. There's four underlying defilements. Attachment, a clinging, a desiring, an attachment to a particular viewpoint, a particular drishti, Attachment to sensual pleasure or kama, K A M M A. Attachment to rupa, form, shape. And the fourth is the actual craving or attachment to existence, to bhava, to being. All right. So she says, world honored one, these four underlying defilements can produce all active defilements. Active defilements, she tells us, arise thought moment to thought moment in tandem with the mind. World honored one. The underlying defilement, the underlying klesha of ignorance does not rise in tandem with the mind from beginningless time. We'll talk about that when we get deeper into ignorance, but let's pause for a minute. I just want to take, it's going to be a little bit, but just a tiny bit. I want to have a quick Dharma talk with you about these four underlying defilements. And it really is necessary to understand what Srimala has to tell us about ignorance. This is a very interesting sutra, I have to tell you. <laughs> I've been reading it, reading it, reading it, studying it, getting ready for these classes. And Srimala's like what she is 
and we're not going to get all the way tonight because it's just too much. So we're taking this in steps. But what she has to tell us is very interesting. And in particular, it's what she has to tell us about ignorance. But before we get to ignorance, let's talk about drishti, kama, rupa, and bhava, these four underlying defilements. So what the idea is, is that these are these underlying kleshas that it's from them that all these other defilements, like you would take something like um, anger. Anger is a classic Buddhist defilement. It certainly arises from devesha, this kind of aversion, right? The, uh, the, that idea. So Srimala is telling us about these four underlying kleshas. And in particular, I didn't have room to write it, but re remember that she says for each of these four, it's about an attachment to a particular point of view, a drishti. It's about attachment to particular sense pleasures. It's about attachment to particular forms. And then ultimately the fourth one is like the wildest one. And I'm hoping I can, you know, kind of get us closer to understanding it. The fourth one is this idea of the very, very attachment and clinging to existence in that way. So let's look at these kind of individually and then as a whole. And again, I think this will just be a really helpful Dharma talk to have. Yeah, Tanya. Um, I, you said something I missed and maybe you're gonna get back to it, but it kind of struck out, stuck out to me about things arising in tandem with the mind not in tandem with the mind. Yep. So, and, and um, so are, are you going to get back to that too? Oh yeah. It's a, it's a okay. very, very, very big part of this, but it has a more to do with the unique nature of ignorance versus these other ones. Cause you'll, you notice Tanya that she was distinguishing these four from ignorance and yeah, I will clarify what she means. Okay. So I'm going to use an example it's one of my classic examples to walk us through these four um, defilements. Many, many of you have seen this example before. I've even pulled it out a few times in Dharma doors. It's just a really, really helpful one for, for kind of thinking about this stuff. So my example here is not, it's just an example, but it's about noticing the way our mind works. So the way this, example works is that we imagine the scenario is that there's two people right so there's me and somebody else and there's a knock at the door and we don't know we don't know who, 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 who what's going on the door and so we go to look through the peephole and when i go look through the peephole i see this and then this other person goes to look through the peephole and they see this. <laughs> All right. So we both looked through the peephole and saw the same thing, right? And yet something happened, which was when I saw it, I got this kind of, um, warm fuzzy feeling and it brought back nostalgic memories of childhood when i went to a petting zoo and there was a little bunny rabbit there and the bunny rabbit actually came and sat on my lap and i petted it and it was like one of the most special days of my childhood so i look at that and i'm thinking wow oh there's a bunny rabbit let's let's let the bunny rabbit come on inside right? But there's this other person who looked through the people and they said, oh, no, we don't want to let that in. And that's because this other person also went to a petting zoo as a child, but they actually were approached by a duck. And when they went to touch the duck, it bit them. And so they developed this kind of phobia to ducks they just you know it gives them a weird feeling and so when they looked through the peephole they were like no no 
I'm, I'm afraid of that, actually. I don't want that to come in. <laughs> this other person, like, what do you mean? It's, what? And so then begins the question of who, who saw what was on the other side of the door? Who saw the, the, the real thing versus who is just in a fantasy land of their childhood nostalgia or childhood memories, right? Now, what, the first thing, so without answering that question of who's right, right, let's just leave that lingering there. I want to use this example, this exact example, to walk us through what these four words mean, what they signify in the world of Buddhism, but in particular, how could it be that these four things are underlying defilements of the mind, right? So both people, it could be suggested, had very similar drishtis, very similar worldviews. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, a worldview, a drishti, these things are so, it, the idea of a drishti or a worldview in Buddhism is so interesting. There's a really great sutra, one of the old original Pali canon suttas called the Brahma Jala Sutta, Brahma's Net. It's also sometimes called the 62 erroneous drishti, the 62 erroneous views and by drishti, by views, they mean the, what that sutra talks about is 62 different ways of imagining the creation of the world, what it means to be alive in the world, and 62 views of where this all goes. Do, do we go to heaven after we die? Do we go to hell? Do we just go back into the earth as dirt and fodder for flowers? Like, what exactly is going on here? What's this all about? Where did we come from? What is the meaning of being here now? And where does this all go? To have a drishti is to have a firm conviction about all of that. Where we came from, what it means to be here, and what it means to go after this. And by the way, even if you are saying to yourself, I don't know, I don't know what, how, I don't know where the universe came from, I don't know what it means to be here, and I don't know where all of this is going, that is still a firm conviction <laughs> in a sense. What I'm getting at is, is that a worldview is so subtle to our thinking that it is an underlying cause of most of our uh, subsequent thinking, if that makes sense. And now a drishti, a view, I mean, it can be big, really developed, like an entire cosmology here, but it doesn't need to be a fully formulated notion of the world. Like I was just saying, it can also be an agnostic position of, of not knowing or something like that. But Within this framework, these two people share a similar view, and that view, I was trying to think of an of a easy way to say, well, what is this view? I would call it kind of like the zoological order, meaning that there's a kind of a, a view that is, um, and you, you, I think you'll know about it very well or have thought about it. It's this kind of view of, call it uh, human superiority kind of a thing. Of course, this plays out in certain religions where they have special mythologies about the origin of humans, that, that we're somehow kind of uh, special. We're not like ducks and rabbits. Ducks and rabbits are like, you know, lower life forms insignificant life forms that we could destroy and kind of eat wantonly. There's a lot of different views when it comes to animal versus human, but to even make the distinction animal versus human puts you squarely within a worldview. Even if you put the human ape 
as part of the continuum and say, oh no, we humans were just highly developed apes, no different than ducks and rabbits. That would still be adhering to a certain zoological view. <laughs> So what I'm getting at here is, again, is how subtle a view is. Again, there's almost a way in which it's a, it's a program, if you want to get kind of uh, technological about it. It's like a program running in the background that we never really reflect on, think about. And actually, it's a presumption or a, a, a series of assumptions that we never think about, and we just go from there. So what I'm getting at is, is that to have a zoological order, to have a notion of animals, plants, and minerals, let's call it, that all of those distinctions are at play, but there's a similarity between these two people in that they both saw an animal. They both saw a creature in that way. Everybody with me on a drishti, on the view? Open so, open so. Let's go on and talk about now Kama. Now, Kama is one of those, also one of those Buddhist ideas that is fundamental, goes all the way back. We again are talking about sensual desire, the desire to taste wonderful things, the desire to hear wonderful sounds, the desire to feel wonderful things, the desire to see wonderful things, the desire to smell wonderful things, desire to think wonderful things. So those six senses corresponding to these sensual arisings, there's a way in which we crave pleasurable ones and we kind of, you know, avoid the displeasurable in that way. So we seek pleasure. But what comma Kama gets a little misconstrued or misunderstood in that way, because it's not just about the pleasurable exactly, because, well, let me just stop beating around the bush and I'll tell you. In our example of our two people, one person who had the positive, the positive reaction to the rabbit, because they saw a rabbit. And that caused them to have this nostalgic feeling. And so they desire to pet the bunny rabbit. They desire to let it, they desire, they want to open the door and let the bunny rabbit in because they would like to pet it or something to that effect. I don't know, maybe they want to eat it, right? Or whatever it is, but there's an idea of a desire there. But the idea is, is that that comma, that particular desire, to pet the bunny rabbit, it's not actually very different than the other person who saw the duck and their desire is to, to get as far away from the duck as possible. So again, I want to just make it clear that comma is tricky because it's not just about pleasure. It's, it's always actually going to be about um, how can I put this? It's always going to be about the way things could be. It's like this future idea. And so, oh, if we just let the bunny rabbit in, I would be so much happier than I am now without the bunny rabbit. <laughs> and the other person's thinking, no, 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 I'm, I'm already a little disturbed by the, the duck. And if we let it in, I'm going to be really disturbed. So, but the ice, so they're both operating on, on these kind of desires, but those desires have already kind of arisen from the view in that sense. This is zoological hierarchy in that sense. And well, it's the, the, the desire or the aversion in that sense, those are of course very much these kind of, um, what, what could we call them, right? Kind of like these psychological dramas that each of these two people is having. And the really, really, really important part to keep in mind about this is that they have really both seen the same thing, yet are having two entirely different 
reactions, they're having two entirely different experiences. And I don't just mean that experientially in terms of pleasurable, displeasurable, they're actually in two different worlds. <clears throat> One's in rabbit land, the other's in duck land. And because this person's in duck land and this person's in rabbit land, they're having these pleasurable or displeasurable experiences. Well, let's dig a little deeper. Let's go one layer deeper. And this other underlying defilement that Srimala has told us about is form. So even before we are afraid of the thing or pleased by the thing, that has already that we've already made a distinction about what it looks like, what it is. And so one person, based upon the form, this is what they call rupa, shape. It looks like a rabbit. It has the form of a rabbit. Or it looks like a duck. It has the form of a duck. So I hope you're starting to see that there's these, it's kind of like this, on, this onion of existence in that sense. And first you're distinguishing what it is you're even looking at. What is that? Oh, it's a rabbit. I love rabbits. <laughs> so you see how that went? There's the confusion about what exactly is that? Oh, I know what that is. I love those. The other person's like, what is that? Oh, I know what that is. I hate those. This is where we get to Connie's question about samskara. Hey, and I have a follow-up question, <laughs> which time. also plays into it. Samskara, and if you want to touch it, which you probably don't like to touch it because nobody likes to touch it, is free will. I got the notes. Let's talk about samskara really quickly. So the samskara isn't uh, explicitly a part of this, but it actually is very implicitly a part of this conversation. So if you're not familiar, samskara is one of the five aggregates, one of the five skandhas, one of the constituent elements of a sentient subject, a sentient being. A body of form, shape, right? Oh, look, a body of form. Oh, look, a body of form. It looks like a Michael, right? So I look like a Michael. That's body of form. Sensations. We've been talking about sensations or Vedana, these reactions to things, positive, negative, or neutral. Form, sensation, perceptions. That is, I don't know, what do you see? The perception is about, is it a duck or is, or sorry, is it a rabbit or is it a duck? That's perception. And the idea is, is that our perception is conditioned. That's samskara. And so Connie, I kind of was met talking about samskara, but without saying it explicitly, the reason why this person, person A, saw the rabbit is because of their conditioning. They, they don't have associations with ducks. Maybe they live somewhere where they don't see a lot of ducks. Maybe ducks have just not been, you know, they weren't a Daffy Duck person. They were more of a Mickey Mouse kind of a person, you know, and so ducks just didn't condition them. The idea is, is that the very perceptions that we make are informed by our conditioning in that sense. And so, that's where conditioning falls into this, but Connie, I'm gonna come back to conditioning. It's, it's gonna uh, rear its ugly head again, and so hold on to that. And then the fifth, the fifth skandha is consciousness. Actually being presently aware, oh, there's a rabbit. Oh, look, a rabbit. So that's being consciously aware that there's a rabbit, but that's actually coming from conditioning which is why I've made the perception. And all of that then is my reaction. My positive reaction is to my conditioning, <laughs> to what I perceived because of my conditioning in that sense. Okay, so those are the skandhas and kind of a quick review of those. 
free will free will is going to have to wait a second connie because in many ways that question pertains to this idea of ignorance and pertains to a lot of what this sutra is about um so i'm going to hold off on free will until the time is right <laughs> thanks connie okay so now we've made it through three of the underlying defilements okay and remember this is the idea that these are smears or smudges on our mind in that way we get convict con convinced and and hold on to views right we are dazzled by our desires in that way they taint our mind in that way the very form the very form is an attachment and i'm using this example because i like how easily you can see that these two people could be attached to a rabbit and a duck, which are two totally different forms. One's a, one's a bird, one's a, you know, it's like very, very different. And so that's that idea of being attached to form. Now, before we move on to this next one, because this next one's tricky, when we talk about enlightenment, when we talk about being wise in that way, when I'm saying that, or when Queen Srimala is saying that attachment to form is a defilement of the mind, I want to make it clear that that doesn't, like, what that means is, is like, I want to say something very uh, delicate, but what we want to look at is how this person a can only see the rabbit they have a kind of myopic narrow view of things and that narrow view of things is this very it it the thing is it's a very firm conviction that it's a rabbit but it doesn't feel like a firm conviction to the person who has it because they really just think they're seeing reality. They're just seeing what's, what's out there. So what I'm getting at is, is that an attachment to form, an attachment to a view, when we become unattached to those things, we just open ourselves up to being able to see maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe the way somebody else sees it. <gasps> Oh, that would be crazy, right? If we were able to actually take in somebody else's point of view in that sense. So I don't want to, I don't want you to at right now, it's not necessarily, it's not necessary to think, well, what would it be like to not be attached to form? It's just about looking at a very narrow <laughs> attachment to form and being like, oh, I could see how not being so rigidly attached to that might free up some possibilities here, some possibilities of thinking, even some possibilities of being in that sense. All right, everybody good with those first three underlying defilements? The last fourth underlying defilement is the actual attachment to existence. Now, if I were gonna go back to my example, both of these people, person A and person B, they're convinced there's something on the other side of the door. Neither of them think there's not something on the other side of the door. So in that sense, they are both attached to existence. They're being a rabbit on the other side of the door, or they're being a duck on the other side of the door. Now, the actual significance of this fourth underlying defilement, it's not quite so much, a, it, I mean, it is. It is definitely about the existence or non-existence of what's on the other side of the door. That's definitely a part of this conversation. But in particular, when they talk about attachment to existence, they're talking about it more self-reflexively in that way, right? So now we're talking about the underlying defilement 
that causes us great fear and anxiety in regards to getting ill and dying. Getting ill and dying are pushing at our attachment to existence in that way. And, when, and we don't want to not exist. We do not want to not exist in that way. And so we are attached to existence. And when it's talking about that as an underlying defilement, and then there, we know that we're talking about clearing up those defilements, we would be talking about no longer having that attachment to existence, to existing, to being in that way. In order to make that, in particular that fourth one, but in particular to make all four of these a little clearer and to lead us towards a better understanding of ignorance, this, this very important Buddhist idea of avidya. In order to do that, I wanna walk us through a combined example. And this is not about, I'll probably mention the duck or the rabbit again, but I wanna introduce an, another idea. So the example that I wanna work with, and, and you, everybody's heard this one a bunch in Dharma doors because I use this example all the time. I want to use the example of a dream, being in a dream state, not in a lucid dream state where you are aware that you're dreaming, not that special, very special state of being in a lucid dream. I'm talking about the good old fashioned dream. One of those good old fashioned dreams that you think is reality, that you think is just another day in your life right? So let's say that you go to bed and then you find yourself in a dream. In that dream reality, you would still be attached to a kind of a view. You would still be very much attached to sensual desire. You would be still attached to form. And in particular, you would be very attached to existence. And what I mean by that is like, let's say something popped up in, in the, the dream and that thing that popped up in the dream looked like, had the form of something scary, something that scares you. I don't know, maybe you have a phobia of some sort, or maybe you just have a good old fashioned dream of being chased by somebody or whatever it is. Wrapped up in that scenario of being in, let's call it a nightmare. Let's call it a nightmare where you are feeling like you're being chased, that you're under threat. All four of these things are firing off. You, you think you know what's coming at you. You have a great desire, a comma to get rid of it. You have a certain view about what's going on, meaning that you think you're in a world, right? That where there's time going on and all of that. So you have a view. You have desires based on the forms that you're seeing. And in this scenario where you are running away for dear life, you have this attached craving to existence, even though you're in no danger. So let, the idea is, is that imagine Oh, oh, so let me, I want to put it to you this way. These things are always very delicate. In the same way that I was trying to suggest that by easing up on the, the attached view that this is a rabbit, easing up on that allows you to see the, the people that see it as a duck. And in fact, really relaxing, it might allow you to see infinite, infinite things in here right? And not just that narrow singular view. In that same way, what I want is, is that when the Srimala, when the Sutra is talking about clearing up that defilement of the craving for existence, we're really talking about not being afraid, like living without fear. And a lot of times when people hear this, there's this kind of assumption, I guess, that 
to not uh, uh, attach um, desperately to the body, to not do that, it doesn't mean that we become idiots and start walking into traffic and doing things because we no longer care about existence and are no longer attached, attached to existence. Far, far, far from it. The idea here is, is that when you, you know, I don't know, when, you know, something comes up and it might be a health issue, let's say, things come up health-wise, there's a way in which our minds go crazy and spin out the scariest possible narratives, the worst case scenarios, and all of this stuff that's arising out of a desperate attachment to exist in that way. And what I'm suggesting, what the sutra is suggesting, what Buddhism is suggesting, is that to not attach and cling so desperately only gets rid of fear. And by not being so afraid, we actually are more clear headed and we actually have much better skills at preserving ourselves. Like, yeah, Connie. Well, yeah, two things come to my mind. One thing is obviously talking about the sutra, um, the samsara really comes to my mind, which obviously plays into that. Um, and then on a personal note, I'm kind of is what you just said about fearlessness and, you know, attached to um, a self is, you know, you see that the more you spend like too much time on your own and too much think about yourself, the more anxious you get, you know, this is really just, that's why, you know, nature works so, so well, I think for all of us or most of us, because you forget for a certain moment the sense of self or when you're in love, for example, right? Or if you have children, you know, it's like, it's less about you. And um, the more you spend your time on your own, um, the, the more obsessed you get. So yeah, on a personal note, but samsara wheel, <laughs> talking about Dharma. Exactly, Connie. And I do want to remind you that this uh, tonight started with this conversation about um, this idea of arhats and pratyekya buddhas actually getting out of the samsaric cycle. And um, just to give you a sneak preview of where we're about to go, what Srimala says is that the arhats and pratyekya buddhas, they've eradicated these four underlying defilements, and that's why they're no longer trapped in samsara, it's why they no longer suffer in that way, all of that. And there's a way in which Srimala is extolling being an Arhat or a Pratekya Buddha. She's just about to say that they have further to go. And it's because they haven't eradicated the underlying defilement of ignorance, which is what we're about to get into. So Connie, your comment about samsaric being trapped in samsara, I'm glad you reminded us of that because that's exactly what's kind of being spoken about here is what keeps us trapped in that kind of cyclical cycle in that way. Okay. Um, I think we're good. Everybody good? Everybody feeling good? Okay. So let's now read about, oh, actually now I'll address uh, Tanya's question because we're at that point. So what Sri Mala says, and by the way, the commentary on this section is vast. The translations on this section are the most diverse, where it's, so it's very, very tricky. But it's this section where she says that the four, these four underlying defilements arise in tandem with the mind, but the underlying defilement of avidya, of ignorance, doesn't rise in tandem with the mind. The language is really tricky. So this idea of arising in tandem, all of these things, but I'll tell you from reading all the commentary, from reading it in Chinese, from reading all the different English translations, the basic idea of this is that the mind as such, and when I say the mind as such, I mean 
your thinking mind right now, the mind, this mind that you're thinking, using to think about what I'm saying, that, that mind as such can notice and be aware of and ultimately kind of do away with these four defilements. They are observable in a kind of um, objective way. What she's saying, and it's not, again, it's not entirely clear in the language. This is coming from the, all the commentary uh, literature. But what she's saying is, is that ignorance, you can't observe it with the mind that it's kind of like that proverbial fish in the fishbowl that can't see the water because they're in the water. The idea is, is the same thing is true about ignorance. We're so deep in it that it's not like these other ones where it's observable. It's very much, um, um, there's a lot of analogies. Um, my favorite of course is the dream analogy. It's why I introduced the dream analogy. Remember when I said, oh no, this it's just a good old fashioned dream. It's one of those dreams that you think is reality. The reason why you would run away from whatever it is in the dream is because you think it's reality. You think that the stakes, they're very, very high stakes and you must get away. And you keep wanting to get away in that sense. And so the idea is, is that to not be aware that you're in a dream, but to be firmly convinced of its reality and to feel that something is at stake and to then be running away in fear, all of that is arising out of the ignorant state of not knowing that you're dreaming. So it's a very helpful place to think about, which is that we have all had dreams and probably even had things that, that have happened in that dream, good or bad, and then woken up a moment later and been like, oh, wow, that was just a dream. Oh, I didn't, I didn't have any reason to be afraid, or I really didn't have that much reason to be so excited. It wasn't even real. It didn't last, right? And so the idea here is, is that to be so deep in the dream that you don't even know you're in a dream state, that's like ignorance, right? It's, it's also another great example is the matrix, right? When, when Morpheus says nobody can be told what the matrix is because you were in it in that sense. Same, very similar example. So whether you like your sci-fi or whether you a good old fashioned dream analogy, that's what she's talking about as far as ignorance. Okay. Oh, sorry, Tanya. Yeah. So, uh, and maybe you're going here, but- in, in I don't know the way where I'm were... going, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe the sutra is going here, but you know, as soon as you start saying that, I'm like, oh, well then the cure for that is understanding emptiness. So, I mean, you know, that kind of shatters the dream, right? Like- Yes, uh, that is the direct so... route. Um, now it's easier, that's easier said to, you know, to say emptiness is easier said than realized in that sense, but your intuition that that is the, that's the way out is correct. Yeah. Is the sutra kind of going in that direction or that's not? It's going actually in its own direction. It, it, it has its own message. Um, about ignorance, about all of this. That's just, it's it, once we really lay this out and it's, it has to be done this way, very step-by-step, step, but once we lay this all out, you're, it's, it'll be very interesting. So, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let's read a little bit more. So after now laying out the four underlying defilements, but then the root underlying cause, which is ignorance, she says, world honored one, the four underlying defilements are powerful. They can breed all other active defilements. Yet, in comparison with them, the underlying defilements, defilement of ignorance 
is so much more powerful that the difference is inexpressible either in figures or analogies. <laughs> That's how different <laughs> these two are. Thus, world honored one, the underlying defilement of ignorance is more powerful than the very craving for existence. Just as the appearance, the power, the authority, and the retinue of Mara, the evil one, overshadows all those of the gods of the Parinirmita heaven, which is like the highest heaven you can get in, just so the underlying defilement of ignorance overshadows the other four underlying defilements. All other defilements, which are more numerous than the grains of sand in the Ganges River, they all depend upon the underlying defilement of ignorance. It also causes the other four underlying defilements to endure. It can be eradicated only by the wisdom of the Buddha, the Tathagata, not by the wisdom of the Shravakas, Arhats, or the Pratyaka Buddhas. This being the case, world honored one, the underlying defilement of ignorance is the most powerful of all. Okay, so that's her thesis. That's what she's working with here. And it's come up a few times, so I just want to uh, mention it. There's, an, there's something that Queen Srimala knows all about. She's very wise very skilled in something. And I have to tell you, the more I read this sutra, the more I'm intrigued by it. I really, I'm going to, I want to go back and really even go deeper into it. I'm intrigued by it because what I've realized is there's a very, very subtle way in which Srimala is flexing her knowledge without flexing her knowledge. And what I mean by that is, is that it's so delicate the way this is done, but she's really saying a lot in, I would say, in absentia, not saying things. And that's very hard to exp uh, explain. I, I probably maybe even I shouldn't have mentioned it because it probably just piques your interest more than anything else. But my point is, is that a, this sutra, in particular, the section that we're reading right now, that is so focused on avidya, it's very helpful for everyone to, to know their 12 link chain of causation, the 12 link chain of dependent origination. I'm not going to go through the whole 12 link chain because then we would never come back to the sutra, but the root of the 12 link chain, the strongest link in the chain is avidya or ignorance. And in fact, if you follow the chain around, it is this very ignorance that gives rise to the conditioning of the mind, gives rise to samskara, and it's that very samskara that gives rise to consciousness or vinyana. So there's a way in which Srimala is referencing all of the 12 link chain of causation, but she's not doing it in this really didactic list form. She's doing it in this really subtle way where, again, she's letting you know she knows all about this, but she's doing it in a very like demure way that I, I have to say I'm really intrigued by it. And so if you know your 12 link ch chain of causation, she says, world honored one, with grasping, upadana, clinging, as the condition and defiled karma or karma's actions as the cause, the three realms are produced. The three realms, of course, are the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. So this is the tridatu, 
we've basically kind of been toying around with these ideas. If you're not familiar really quickly, of course, the three realms are kind of like the three sheaths of reality, the sheath of projected <clears throat> desires, like our duck rabbit scenario, where each person is projecting onto the form. <clears throat> That's the realm of desire. The realm of form is the duck or the rabbit, not how we feel about it, but just duck or the rabbit. And then the formless realm is that most subtle realm that has no shape form at all. She just said that with grasping as the condition and defiled action as the cause, the three realms are produced. We could just talk about that probably for weeks, weeks and weeks, just that idea, but I digress. Likewise, she says, with the underlying defilement of ignorance as the condition and undefiled karmas as the cause, the mind created bodies of arhats and Prateki Buddhas and very powerful bodhisattvas are produced. These three kinds of mind created bodies and the undefiled actions all depend on the underlying defilement of ignorance being conditioned as well as conditioning. Therefore, World Honored One, the three kinds of mind-made bodies and undefiled actions all have the underlying defilement of ignorance as their condition. Just as the craving of existence also depends on the underlying defilement of ignorance as its condition. So last week we talked about these three mind-made bodies. The mind-made bodies of arhats, the mind-made bodies of pratyeka buddhas, and the mind made bodies of very powerful bodhisattvas. What she just said, by the way, she's, Srimala is advancing an argument. I have to tell you, this is a very, very well thought out argument that she's starting to make these moves, these very logical syllogistic moves. And the very, very interesting move that she just made is that she said that these mind-made bodies, which is basically, by the way, it is how arhats, pratekya buddhas, and bodhisattvas escape samsaric rebirth, is by the creation of a mind-made body in deep states of meditation and the transference of their consciousness to that mind made body. And she just said that the underlying defilement of ignorance is the condition and undefiled actions. Those two together are the cause of those three kinds of mind made bodies. She's making this point about ignorance that's very, very, very interesting. Is everybody with me? Everybody doing okay? World honored one. The underlying craving for existence functions differently from the underlying defilement of ignorance. So these four, and most of all that one, functions differently than the underlying defilement of ignorance. The underlying defilement of ignorance is different from the other four underlying defilements. And for this reason, it can be eradicated only by the Buddha. How's that? How so? Why, you may ask? Because though the Arhats and Pratyekya Buddhas have eradicated the four underlying defilements, they have not fully mastered the power and utter exhaustion of all defilements. They have not realized that perfected state. And why? World honored one. 
To say that their defilements have been exhausted is an exaggeration. Being clouded by the underlying defilement of ignorance, the arhats, pratekya buddhas, and bodhisattvas in their last samsaric existence do not know and perceive all dharmas, all truths. Because they do not know and perceive all dharmas, all truths, they have left uneradicated what should be eradicated and, and have left unfinished what should be finished. Because they have not eradicated and finished all that should be eradicated and finished, they have attained incomplete liberation. Not complete liberation. Incomplete purity. Not complete purity. Incomplete merit. Not complete merit. World Honored One. Because they have only attained incomplete liberation, not thorough liberation, and only incomplete merits, not all the merits, their knowledge of suffering is incomplete. Their eradication of the cause of suffering is incomplete. Their realization of the cessation of suffering is incomplete, and their following of the path that leads to the cessation of suffering is incomplete. Queen Sri Mala continued, World Honored One, if one knows suffering only in part, eradicates the cause of suffering only in part, realizes the cessation of suffering only in part, and follows the path only in part, that person is said to have realized partial nirvana. One who has realized partial nirvana is only advancing toward nirvana. However, if one knows suffering completely, eradicates all the causes of suffering completely, realizes the complete cessation of all suffering, and follows the path to its entirety, then one realizes the permanent, quiet, cool nirvana within an impermanent, decadent, corrupt world. World Honored One, such a person can be a protector and a refuge for the world. Where there, ah, I blew that one, such a beautiful line. She says, world honored one, such a person can be a protector and a refuge in a world where there is no protector and no refuge. How so? One who sees high and low things cannot realize nirvana. Only one who perceives equality, equality in wisdom, equality in liberation, and equality in purity. Only that can realize nirvana. Therefore, nirvana is called the uniform, one flavor, one taste. And what is that one flavor, that one taste? It is the taste of liberation. World Honored One, one cannot attain nirvana that one taste, the uniform taste of liberation, if one does not completely eradicate and exhaust the underlying defilement of ignorance. How so? Why is that? Because if one does not do so, one cannot completely wipe out all of the defilements that should be wiped out. All the defilements, which are more numerous than the grains of sand in the Ganges River. If one does not wipe out all the defilements, which are more numerous than the grains of sand in the Ganges River, one cannot realize all the merit, which are equally as numerous as the grains of sand in the Ganges River. 
This being the case, the underlying defilement of ignorance is the breeding ground of all defilements that should be eradicated. From it, the underlying defilement of ignorance, arise all the defilements causing hindrances to the mind, hindrances to tranquility, hindrances to contemplation, meditation, attainment, effort, wisdom, fruition, realization, power, and fearlessness. From it, the underlying defilement of ignorance, arise all the defilements more numerous than the grains of sand in the Ganges River, all the defilements that can be eradicated only by the enlightenment of the Tathagata and by the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. All active defilements depend upon the underlying defilement of ignorance, for ignorance is their cause and their condition. World Honored One, these active defilements arise thought moment to thought moment in tandem with the mind. However, World Honored One, the underlying defilement of, of ignorance never arises in tandem with the mind from beginningless time. Okay, I got to stop because frankly, I'll just keep going and going and going and going because it's actually how the sutra starts to you right when you think, oh, I'll stop there. I, I, I mean, after this next sentence, I, I mean, after this next sentence. So I'm going to pause there. Questions, comments, answers, ideas, anything percolate up? Um, oh, oh, watch out for that. <laughs> okay. Are we good? Okay. good. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what now? Um, M Michael, um, are you, are you, are you trying to say that, um, that the, like, you can't sort of logic your way into understanding your ignorance? Like, it's like, you can't sort of use the brain to get to that you don't get the whole thing? Question mark? It's, it's about, and again, Srimala has a very interesting thing to tell us about ignorance. And she's, she's planting these little uh, linguistic hints. Um, but what she's saying regarding that last part, point, Brendan, is, is basically, yes, ignorance is such an underlying cause that it's basically like, Well, the funny thing is, is that, you know, I, I kind of, I tried to uh, cut this one off at the pass, so to speak, but I've, I've of course been waiting for somebody to ask, what is ignorance? Yeah, just, yeah. And I'm kind of, you know, what a question, right? It's, again, that's what I mean. You can't, it can't really be said. And that's why I use these analogies. I use the dream analogy. And this idea that when you're in the dream so deeply, you, you, anything that you think of in that space, it's not going to get you anywhere. Now, everybody knows too, or most people know, I love uh, using the dream analogy because we do have that precious lucid dream experience. And I often equate Bodhi awakening with a lucid dream. The only difference is a lucid dream is just you in your dreamland. Awakening is when you become lucidly aware of this dream-like reality. And you start to have the same lucid disposition towards this that you do in a dream. So the lucid dream is that moment where we become aware that it's a dream, even though we're in the dream. So that's key to this. But part of, and again, I'm, I'm not going to try to um, hide anything. I want to try to be as direct as I can with her message. Srimala is about to start telling us that there's something kind of special about ignorance. 
that it's the birthing ground of Buddhas. And so it's in a way, the critique that she's making about the Arhats and the Pratekya Buddhas is that they haven't fully understood in ignorance. They're still living in this dualistic realm of ignorance versus enlightenment. So that didn't answer your question, Brendan, but I said a lot of interesting things. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, you know, that was, uh, yeah. I mean, I, you can't know what you don't know, but you can know that you probably don't know something about what's going on. And suffering is sort of like an indicator. That, I mean, that was my original question is like, you know, suffering is telling you something about your ignorance not that you know it's like being chastised it's like this other sort of potentially leading you to like yeah alleviating mm -hmm. that in, in some way or another um so yeah, yeah I, but uh, yeah i mean you're right to be like there's more man it's, it's, gonna, it's mm -hmm. gonna get crazier but um you're... uh so i'm i take my question off the air or off the, oh no but i, the, I wanted to comment though your you your, did answer. your your statement about but it how do you know what you don't know that's a very, that's the right way to think about it, which is we're in this position where we don't know what we don't know. And yeah, let me try to, let me try to actually explain ignorance in that sense. So to use Brendan's, how do you know what you don't know kind of an example in that way. I often really, really, um, I really like to use this Buddhist analogy. Everybody's heard this one from me a million times. The Buddhist analogy is this, the one about being lost in the woods. And if you're lost in the woods and you don't know which way is north, south, east, or west, you don't have a compass, there's no stars, there's no moon, you're totally, totally lost. What the Buddha says is, the moment you don't care where you're going, you're no longer lost. Just like that. Now, usually when we think about being lost and being found, so to speak, or finding our way, usually it's like, oh, I'm lost. Is my house that way or is it that way? Oh, maybe it's that way. Could be that way. I don't know. I don't know. I'm lost. The normal way in which we get unlost is somebody says, oh, north is that way. And you go, oh, great. I have obtained knowledge of which way is north. So now I'm no longer lost because of what I acquired. I acquired the knowledge I was seeking, no longer lost. Yeah, that, that works. But that, that Buddha way, that Buddha way, that's like kind of kind of cool, right? Because it's sort of like you unlose yourself, you unlost yourself. It, there's something very beautiful in that idea of, oh, I can just make myself not lost anymore by going about it the right way. I like that example because it points to this idea that you get unlost by letting go. Michael, that reminds me of this beautiful saying by Ram Das: um, "When you when you don't uh, when you stand nowhere, you can stand everywhere." Beautiful, good. beautiful, exactly. And so, the idea of ignorance, really quickly, Tanya, the re idea of ignorance is that we don't we're lost. And we're trying to find our way. And it's sort of like, ah, uh, should I make a lot of money? Maybe I should make a lot of money. That'll, that'll do it, right? Or no, maybe I should, or no, what, what should I do? Like, and so we're searching and searching and searching for meaning and seek all of these things. And there's that interesting Buddha way, which is recognizing that all the striving and all the seeking is causing the exhaustion. And at any moment, you cannot do the clinging, grasping, wanting thing and no longer be lost. 
it's such a beautiful teaching, right? Okay, so that's a little bit about ignorance. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Tanya, then Noam. Tanya was... No, it's okay. Um, and I have to give a little background. I just came off of a week long retreat where it was all about like emptiness, non duality, and non doing. <laughs> so oh, well, right, right. It's like very flavoring, like what I'm thinking about. So, you know, the whole thing about like not getting there by thinking, like you said, it's like about letting go, but also like by in that letting go, then you can experience like the non duality and emptiness of things, right? Which is the cure seems to me to ignorance right it's because we're ignorant about ex what existence is right or what how we're and i'm not saying that there's any sort of ultimate reality that's not the point i would be a clinging right exactly and you can't you shouldn't even cling to like emptiness and non-duality so it's, it's again it's like this profound just like letting go um and ex and not thinking your way there but like kind of experiencing it so, and, and, and when you mentioned the, I, when I was thinking about it earlier, I was thinking of the Vajra too, just like, you know, so does that, <laughs> but is that, I mean, cause that, um, it, does that kind of make sense in the context it, of this? It makes perfect sense, beautiful sense. And it really, I feel like ties Brendan's um, kind of comment together with that too, with not being able to think our way out of it in that sense. No, great Tanya. Um, so is the, the sort of critique of that she's making of certain people's uh, supposed enlightenment not being clear, it's, it's because they've achieved it. It's the achievement itself. That's the, that's the, that's the short, uh, that's uh, what the shortfall or, or something, or, you know, the sort of that they did something <laughs> by, by doing something to attain it, they actually haven't attained it. Um, yeah, and, and at this point, no, we would really be, um, you know, participating in the commentary because she doesn't explicitly say, but yes, we are to understand from, from the commentary and from other things that the critique is one of duality. Duality. In particular, the do and she lists three. I would just want to pay attention to one. In particular, it's the about purity. The arhats and the pratekya buddhas are in a system of purification, and they are considered the most pure. Mm -hmm. The rest of us are considered not pure. And she's critiquing anybody that has that view of superior, inferior. In fact, that is the line, that really important line where she says, no high and low, where's the line? Hmm. Ah, at a certain point, I can't find it now, but she says that there is no high or low. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a reference to the idea of these really noble Pratekya Buddhas and Arhats that are sort of like, you can imagine them up on a dais with, mm -hmm. the, with, the, with the whisk and people are leaving you know, gifts at their feet and they're all so holy while all the rest of us are down there so not holy, so impure, so defiled. And what Sri Mala is saying, what Mahayana Buddhism is saying, is that it's that very mind that splits things into high, low, superior, inferior. That's defilement mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in that way. And so her message is really Vajra sharp mm -hmm. in, in that way. And so, yes, it's a critique of what seems to have been that kind of very hierarchical situation where the Arhats and the Pratekya Buddhas were uh, considered very noble. And it's kind of a whole uh, holier than thou kind of a thing going on too. Your example of being lost, which I always love, no matter how many times I hear <laughs> it, but it also makes me think about that, the, you know, the the uh, the the arhats and the Pratekya Buddhas who who have to leave to get to Nirvana. Well, you know, that's 
if they had to leave, then they then they didn't get to Nirvana because that's that's like the the person in the woods who someone tells them, oh, that's that way is north, right? Thank you for tying that together. Yeah, excellent, Noam. And I did want actually you you said something, so I want to repeat the very very beautiful line. It's exactly so. Noam just said this. I'm just repeating it from the sutra. She said. If one knows, and oh, by the way, too, you caught the Four Noble Truths lesson that we still get a lesson in the Four Noble Truths, right? So beautiful there. And she says, however, if one knows the First Noble Truth, knows suffering completely, and Second Noble Truth, one eradicates all causes of suffering completely, one realizes the complete cessation of suffering, and number four, follows the path to its, in its entirety, then one realizes the permanent, quiet, cool nirvana within an impermanent, decadent, corrupt world. That's it. That's it. And Noam said it about the Arhat Pratekya Buddha. They're out, out of the corrupt uh, world. No, the Bodhisattva has nirvana right in it in that way. And that's, um, well, that's good news, frankly. I mean, but any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Okay, because that is a, a very, very good stopping point because we're coming up on a very big section, so we will not uh, open that up. Um, but yeah, I think we made good progress tonight. I think we uh, got further along, certainly. But again, she's laying out this very interesting argument about ignorance. So I'm glad that we had such a good conversation about ignorance. <laughs> um, all right, everybody. Then on that note, I think I might just call it a night. Simple dimple. We had a smart discussion about ignorance. It, exactly. <laughs> Calm, cool, collected. <laughs> no, we did. I like great questions too. Always, as always, everybody. Really great comments, and questions, and ideas. So, all right. Uh, so, uh, stay tuned for part eight next week. Um, otherwise, I'm going to pass it back to Noam for any any big news. <laughs>